O-O-Y-X. Oh, okay, fine. I've heard that. Got it. Yeah. I've okay. Got it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and uh, he's going to give us, a, he's given us talks before. And he's going to give a talk tonight called On the Air on HF with no PTT or receiver. I don't know how he's going to do it, but uh, he, I think he'll tell us what he did. So I'll, I'll now then, if without a courtesy, you know, because uh, we're all people, we do pass wind and do all sorts of things. Put your mics on mute, yeah, while Dave's talking. Yeah, there you are. Okay, Simon, you do the sharing bit. I can't, I, I can't handle it. It's high tech, you see. Well, Just give me a give me a wave if you can hear me, one of you or Simon. That's very good. Thank you. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting me to your uh, soiree. Um, I did notice you were commenting about uh, meetings, and as you see after my call sign, it says H A R S. That's the Hereford Amateur Radio Society, and we had a meeting on Friday by Zoom. But it's customary in the in a in Haas to meet at Jeff's uh, QTH, which is an old factory, um, and that's in the summer months. But he doesn't like us going there in the winter because all the parking uh, messes up his lawns and drives and the cars, etc. So we go to we decamp to um, a village hall at Bodenham, and um, that is extremely capacious and lots of car parking and lots of windows. So we're actually going to run, I think, the October meeting at the Village Hall at Boddenham. So we're sort of grasping the nettle like you are really, and thinking, well, we'll have to do something or we'll never do anything. So that's just an aside there, it looks like uh, we're thinking about that like you are. Okay, so yeah, Dave Porter, very old, uh, got a big birthday next year. Uh, you'll be pleased to know uh, <laughs> I'm not, but I started uh, my career with the British Broadcasting Corporation in 1970 by going to the education centre at Wood Norton and having my mind reprogrammed. Uh, I joined as a technical assistant in the transmitter department and it was an interesting course, uh, A course number four. They'd run TA courses before then until number 36. And when they got to that, they stopped and started to have A courses. And the first transmitter A course, I think, was number two. Uh, I was on number four. It was studios were the in-between courses. So we saw the lads and girls, well, mainly lads there on A3. Uh, they were sort of doing theirs as we started ours in September 1970. And it was an interesting course because you, you left just before Christmas. If you passed you got a job. If you failed, you got the sack. It, um, it concentrates the mind with regard to studying the documentation and the practicals that they gave you over the three months. Nevertheless, I did pass and was uh, sent to Daventry Transmitting Station uh, to another course uh, for a couple of months. That was the sort of hands-on one. And then I was released. And the, the, the customs were that half the the course of 10 or 12 would be sent to uh, Daventry or Skelton in Cumberland and the other on the that's the one course on the next course they'd be sent to Rampersham or uh, Wolferton that's how it worked I think in those days but I was selected to stay at Daventry which was fine by me coming from Nottinghamshire it wasn't uh, too too far to get home I could have I could have gone to Cumberland but the thought was fairly horrendous really so I carried on doing that for a bit and uh, then they decided to get rid of the technical assistance on the shortwave stations and make it uh, engineer only. Well, I wasn't qualified at that yet, but we'd happened to go on a day trip to Droitwich and they had TAs there, technical assistants on shift. So I put in for a TA job and got it because one lad wanted to go to studios. So he was released and I took his place and stayed there a couple of years. And from there, I went to uh, the engineer course that were again at Wood Norton pleased to say I passed that and then you were you were sent to a station I was sent to Washford in Somerset medium wave Welsh home service 881 kilohertz or as it was then and uh, radio one on 1214 247 so at Washford I had six months there then got tempted by television bad move um, went to Sutton Caulfield had been there before on training but ended up there for a bit more training 
and then sent to a god-awful place. Seemed like a good idea at the time. And I went to Home Moss. Uh, no, Vile. You probably see it on Last of the Summer Wine, thinking this is all right. It's not so good in February, I can assure you. Um, and no, no bases. You couldn't get a permanent post on the station. You'd be sent there for six months and then worked off to another one. Thought knickers to this. So I put in for a job at um, Rampersham. I didn't get it, but uh, they said, why are you doing this? I said, well, I wouldn't mind coming back to uh, sound transmitters, AM. And he said, the personnel guy said, give me a ring next week and we'll see what we can do. So I rung him up, Chris Bridge, and he says, do you fancy four months in Scotland and then a permanent base at Daventry? I says, yeah, you're on. <laughs> so off I went to Daventry uh, via Scotland. That was Wester Glen in Scotland. Um, did six months there, no, four months there. And got back to Dav. I walked into the, um, to the office and Frank Eels, who was a scouser, looks at me and says, you've been here before. And I says, yes, Mr. Eels, yes. I says, I was here a couple of three or four years ago. He says, uh, you're right on nights tomorrow. Yes, Frank, thank you very much. It's as though you'd never been away. It was quite bizarre. So that was Daventry. I uh, met and married the station cook, took her away, much to the annoyance of the staff, because they finally got a good one. And I got promoted then uh, to Brookman's Park in Hertfordshire, the London Regional a bit near Broadcasting House and the powers that be, really. You couldn't get away with much uh, there without them knowing. Uh, did a couple of, four years there, including the wave change of 1978 when we moved all the stations around on the dial. That was uh, quite exciting and quite entertaining. But uh, by as usual in the BBC, if you sort of end up doing modernisation, you end up doing yourself out of a job because all the old kit gets taken away and the modern kit gets put in, in its place. So I um, looked for a job and there was one going at Wufferton in Shropshire. I almost stopped at Drawbridge on the way by, but uh, decided to carry on to Wufferton, which had just been uh, expanded to 10 transmitters instead of six. It's got 10 at uh, 250 kilowatts, 300 kilowatts. And um, I spent the next 30 years there having more children. Uh, Matt, who's licensed now, he's G8XYJ. He's got my old call. And he's just started a job there as a transmitter engineer. So uh, that's good news. So the porters continue at Wolfburton. And there's a couple of more uh, youngsters have started as well, which is all good news as the, uh, as the older people have uh, hung up their earthing ones. OK. Being on HF without a PTT and without a receiver, well, if you're going to do that, you're going to end up broadcasting because you're not in charge of your receiver. And that's what this one's all about. So I'll share the screen and put up some stuff about broadcasting. Uh, mainly, uh, it's the classic government thing, really. All this seems to be Euro government um, changes. And, but not UK, but Euro. There's a bit in the UK, but mainly Euro on HF. You'll, 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 be aware that HF for many years has been the uh, the shouting match department for um, countries. Uh, it was said in the 1960s that if you were an up and coming country, just got independence from the uh, the horrible uh, slave driving whatevers as they say these days. If you just got your independence, you had to have a couple of three things. One of them was your own airline, like Ghanaian Airlines when well, they got away from the uh, UK in 1960. You have your own, um, well, the other thing you have, you have your own shortwave station and your own shortwave service. That was a big deal. So lots of countries went into the international broadcasting and um, it was a valued asset. But nowadays, after sort of 1990, 19. 99 it's starting it was tending to be a long slow fade and countries were pulling out of shortwave broadcasting relying more on the internet particularly so since 2010 so there's not the demand on the channels uh by the broadcasters by the countries by the the governments and so it become, became a sort of possible to sail uh, a an item that could be sold or rented out by uh, the ptts or whatever of the country by the Ofcoms in this country but um, it was rented out 
particularly it kicked off in Germany with um, the Bundesnetz Agentur, which is their version of Ofcom. They also look after gas and electricity. So quite a big uh, concern is that the, uh, the, the BNET stay. And they uh, said to some youngsters up there who'd been clamoring to have licenses on shortwave, yeah, you can have them. Um, write down what you'd like and we'll charge you a fee. And uh, there were a few there were a few sites in Germany that were taken over by um, private HF broadcasters. That well, some of them were ex-mil, uh, not broadcasting sites particularly, but they were ex-military comm sites. But they did all right for broadcasting. So they took those over. They got one or two or five kilowatt transmitters. But quite a few of them wanted to go about it their own way. And I've happened to know a couple of German lads for a long time who've been dabbling on the um, higher power than the amateur license on AM. And they said, uh, well, we've got a Siemens one, trans uh, one, one kilowatt transmitter and we'd like to use that grid mod. So yeah, I can see you're all going, oh my God. Yeah, grid modulation, so not terribly efficient. And uh, it's rubbish, they say. And I says, yes, I was aware of that. <laughs> so what can you do? I says, well, we can uh, sort of organize some HF equipment for you. It just so happened that in this country, exactly the same thing had happened on medium wave with a lot of stations deciding to leave it. And it gave the community people a chance to put in for tickets and they're off advertised by Ofcom who uh, said, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, let you have, we'll let you have one. You'll need to bid for it. Uh, you'll have to produce loads and loads of paper and reasons why you want to do it, but you can have a go and we'll charge you 600, 800, 1,000, 2,000 quid for all the processing of the applications. And if you're lucky and it goes to tender and there's four or five groups apply, you might be the one that gets it. But not all the monies are refundable, but thank you very much. So have a go. And it so happened that uh, quite a few stations, mainly uh, Asian Muslim ones, a few... Uh, Pakistani type stations as well they had a go and uh, John Sketchley in Leicestershire was already running a station on 1386 kilohertz uh, for Ashby de la Zouch and another one for Loughborough he got those two running at sort of five watts output and they said to him hey John we're, gonna, we're thinking of uh, putting this MF out do you want to put in for a ticket so he thought yeah okay I'll have a go so he, he said to me, what shall I do? I said, well, ask him for 500 watts, see what they say. <laughs> and he said, OK. I said, what frequency? I said, well, see what they'll do. It, it, and that's exactly what he said to them. What frequency could I have? And they said, well, what do you want? We'd never heard anything like this before. It was normally, thou shall be allocated a frequency and we will tell you what it is. So John picked 1476 kilohertz because it was a clear channel because the station in in Vienna had closed down, so we knew he got a good channel. Top of the band, he'd been using flagpost antennas, helically wound, and they knew they worked well. So he decided to go for 500 watts output and said to me, can you build me a transmitter? So I've been doing quite a few of these for these ethnic stations. And I got a standard design. And if I go into the presentation now, I'll show you the HF version of it, uh, which is... Uh, Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Right, can somebody give me a wave that they can see that on the screen or tell me, Simon? Yeah, I see it. Well, see yeah, it. That's fine, that's brilliant. Excellent, okay. So there's the title one. So let's go to the uh, next one. Oh, there we are. Okay, so here's the screen. Uh, here's, on the screen now it is a standard as I make them, 250 watt unit, AM, amplitude modulated. This happens to be a short wave one, but the medium wave one is not a lot different because all you get are bigger coils, really. And a crystal oscillator rather than a frequency synthesizer. So this is the front panel view of a 250 watt AM transmitter. I don't know whether you can, can you see if my mouse moves on the screen, Simon? As yes, a it's, it's moving. Yes, it's working. Right yep. Okay, so you've got the mains switching at the bottom here. Orcs, uh, the, main go, the mains goes in at the back on an IEC connector. 
So uh, the aux is switched on, and then it's valves. So the valve heaters warm up. There's also a delay board in it that waits till 40 seconds have passed and then lights the lamp and says, the delay has timed out, your filaments are warm, you can now switch on the HV if you want to. There's the HV switch. Just one HV supply in the entire machine. Um, this one has got a 12 volt output terminal and a synthesizer input BNC socket, so we can power this machine up here, which is a, a synth from GW4GTE, Dave, in North Wales, Buckley, Cluid, and Eric in uh, South Wales near Wenvo makes the printed circuit boards that goes in the kit. And it's the um, it's a frequency synthesizer. So you've got the ability to change the freaks, et cetera, et cetera, on the knob. Uh, the next switch along is a reduced and low power switch. So, uh, sorry, reduced power or full power. So you can tune it up on reduced power and then switch to full indication by LED. And the most one of the most important things there is a drive interlock, which I'll explain about in a second, but that's the indication to show that it's working. You've got two meters here, grid current and cathode current um, on the output valves and a PA load, a PA two, a um, power amplifier tune capacitor and a power amplifier load capacitor on a Pi network on the output. And there's an RF monitor socket here. The MF ones are slightly different in that grid current meter and the cathode current meter are together. Who's running water? That's better. <laughs> the uh, grid current and the cathode current meter are together, but the right hand meter is replaced by a one milliamp unit that runs from an SWR uh, bridge because Dave Thorpe. G4FKI of Ofcom, who's the field engineer who comes and vets the medium wave versions, always wants to see an output power meter. So I just use a, a VSWR sampling line, get a bit of um, forward power, rectify it, drive a one milliamp movement and use a pot on the back to set it to seven, seven on the, on the, on the meter, seven tenths of a milliamp. And uh, that just sits there and reads full power. And then he takes a photograph of it on the site and everybody's happy because he wants to make sure that when he goes back to visit, it's not reading more than seven. It, but you can make it read what you like with the pot at the back, but we don't tell them that. So that's the, um, that's the differences on the versions, but this is the shortwave one. Now the next picture, if it goes, is the, uh, is the, is the rear view of it you'll see um, some fairly hefty mains transformers here. There's a mains transformer here and a modulation transformer here. The mains transformer is made, they're both, made, they're both the transformers are made for me by Tony at Cradley, which is near Malvern. He used to be a production manager at Scott Transformers, S-K-O-T. So he knows all about that. He's retired now, but he's king of the iron. So he builds me a transformer here. This is mains in, just one winding, 0 230. Uh, it gives out 0 645 or 675. Pick which tap you like. There's three taps. 0 645, 675. Because not everybody wants to run 250 watts. They're happy to run 200. Um, he makes the modulation transformer as well. This is for high level class B. So you've got a, an amplifier that drives in class B, but it can be even solid state, well, more so solid state now, three ohms or six ohms input. And they used uh, digital techniques to get lots and lots of power, RMS power into that socket there, which is a, a loudspeaker socket for disco amps. So you just get a big boy's disco amp, 600 watt or 300 watt rating. It's always best if you want 300 watts to buy a 600 watt one if you're buying a solid state. Because um, these things want to be on the air and they don't want to break. And it's often the disco amp that stops. The actual valve kit seems to work okay. The uh, maths with regard to this is that if you want 250 watts output from these three tubes here, you're going to have to put in about 360 watts of DC power. 
uh, about 800 volts and the corresponding amount of milliamps to get um, about 360 watts. To modulate 360 watts to 100% mod, you want 180 watts of audio. So that's what this transformer has got to cope with. So that's the three PA tubes. They're Russian valves, uh, X mil in Chinese sockets, which are just about okay. They are ceramic, but um, I would have preferred them a bit more rugged, as you'll see when we turn over the, 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 the transmitter in a minute. The other three valves you can see, these two are the same. They're PL84s, uh, TV tubes, 15 volt heater, and were used in, uh, in TVs, et cetera, in the 1960s. They're equal, they're equivalent, they're 15 volt heaters. And if you bought the six volt version, they'd be EL86s, not the more common and very, very expensive now, EL84s. But these are PL84s, common, two pounds each from a boy in Spain. Can't go wrong. He must have got a lorry full. Um, the other tube is another PL84. Why? Because it works okay. And it means the spares holding only has to be PL84s and these Russian tubes. These Russian tubes dated from 19, from the early 1940s. They were Wehrmacht tubes uh, for the Nazi regime uh, made by Telefunken and the Russians borrowed the design after the war and uh, perfected it to get a, a 40 watt dissipation anode and a very rugged tube, all single ended. There's no connections at the top. They're just the handles to pull them out of what would be professional Russian valve holders, which are getting a bit like rocking horse poo now. You can't seem to get those. So you have to use the, uh, the Chinese ones. Uh, but all the connections are at the bottom as you'll see in a bit. The other bits of interest, there's the back of the meters. You've got the PA tune capacitor, wide space because of the voltage across it, and the PA load capacitor, uh, which is a, a thousand picofarads, two 500s together. There's an isolating capacitor there, which will, that's a Burkitt's, thousand puff, 10 kV. And one of the most expensive bits of the transmitter is the RF choke that uh, connects the, eight, the modulated HT um, up to the HT line and then down to the valves. But there's the coupling capacitor that lets the RF flow through from the end of that choke out to the output circuit. So it's got it's in a hard position, we're hard working position, the RF choke. They're from the States and they're about, uh, by the time you paid the VAT and the customs duty and the border force and all that lark and the post office's collection fee for handing it across the step to you, it's about 50 pounds. It's 1.1 millihenries at 800 milliamps. So they're still making them. Uh, well, they're still available. And uh, you have to get them from the States because nobody's got those. The Chinese actually haven't copied that. These are two big boys resistors, 10K each, 25 watts. And they're from China, but I think I've used them all up now from there. This is a feed through insulator to get the voltage from the one side of the chassis to the other. There's a smoothing choke here that's X Pi telecoms. And there's a big boys inductor here, um, about 10 turns we tap at. And this one's set to the 49 meter band. Put a few more turns on, you can get to the 75 meter band. And that was what the Germans allocated for those, the two, that was what the German authorities allocated for the two German lads who I've known for a long time. He allocated 3975 for one transmitter and 6160 for the second. Uh, one of the first rigs I ever built was for uh, another guy in Germany, DL2BIS, and he had 6150 kilohertz. So just 10 kilohertz away from uh, the later ones. So that's the setup of the above the chassis. Go to the next slide. And this is uh, part of it underneath. I've got some circuits, but we'll show you those in a bit. And uh, we'll just talk you through here. We can see where the mains comes in on the, on the back running. It comes in at the back and then runs along down here to the main switch at the front. Then it's got the neon for the delay. There's the main, the aux switch. That puts the heaters on with the two filament transformers here. Um, the delay is timed out by a, 
a, a triple five timer and a driver transistor and a relay and it's just there there's the uh, there's the relay that works the delay um so that work that comes on there's the there's the drive input and the 12 volts out and there's the high low power switch and the leds the main ht rectifier is here by 255s 12 of them they're 1300 volts each so better to fit a good few rather than risk it with with just four or eight so we put 12 on to make sure we've got plenty of voltage on uh, available on there so that they won't break down underneath is another tag block with mains connections there's a, a bank of neutrals there and switch mains on some of the tags underneath and uh, 12 volt dc and the connections from the main ht transformer are there as a, a green one a brown one and an orange one so they're they're located underneath to select which tap you want whether you want to go for 645 or 675 um there's the the because it's hf and you're using a synthesizer here it's only half a volt peak to peak so you need a little amplifier to boost that. And this is an American design made by WA1FFL, the waffle amp. And it's got a chip in it and an output transistor and a toroid. And how it works is that you just put your half a volt in here and you get 10 volts or 12 volts peak to peak swing out of that toroid into a high impedance, which is great because we're going to go into this valve here and valves are high impedance. So that's what that's designed for. It works really well. Once 12 volts from there, it is from a, a little 12 volt power supply that we uh, use from the filament winding. So that's the waffle amp that drives the driver stage, which is the tube there. You've got a tune circuit in the anode and the capacitor to tune it and the various components around it, which we'll look at. There's the 12 volt power supply from the, uh, from the filament supply. 12 volts AC gives you 12 volts DC. Then we'll skip in a second to look at the next bit, which is the lineup of the tubes and this tag strip along here. So I'll just get the next slide. So here's the three PA tubes together. And there's a hole in the chassis there for the anodes and the suppressor components to prevent any spurious on the anodes. These are the anode connections from the valves. And if you look, you can see the pins as they go around in a circle, eight pins. Every, these, this pair here and there and there are all earthed in a row. Got a close-up of those in a minute. Uh, the cathodes are decoupled by 0.1 and the screens are decoupled by 1,000 picofarads and the grids are driven by the 22 ohms from this point here. So that's the paralleled trio of output tubes. The HB supply um, is a bank of three capacitors and the lads I buy these from I've seen they come from South Wales and normally go to the Telford Rally and these are 450 UF at 450 volts. So there's uh, put them in series gives 150 microfarads. But behind this blue thing here are three more caps you can't see because I've got pictures in the way of people on the on this Zoom meeting. But there are three more smaller caps there of 220 UF in series. So that's the, uh, the thing there. There's some dropper resistors here from the main HT. Uh, 10K, sorry, 20K, 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 20K. Series parallel gives you 20K. Two, in, two, two and two together in parallel, connected to two together in parallel, gives you 20K. And that drops the HT, the 800 volts, so you can power the, the driver stage down here. There's about 200 volts on that. I'll just pop those underneath. And there's a big hole in the chassis to let air flow through when it's, when it's working. This tag strip here has got to quite a few bits on the, the the piece at the end here is a meter shunt because you've got about uh, you want 500 you want to be able to read up to 500 milliamps so you put the meter shunt in the cathode and then put your meter across it by switching if it's a medium wave one or to a dedicated meter if it's the short wave one you've got an rf choke here 
that's on the end of these feeds. Uh, so the RF comes through that capacitor, hits the end of the choke, then goes on to the three connections into the tubes. The end of this, we'll look at it on the circuit, um, enables you to look at the DC that's being generated there on the auto bias. And we use that to control the, those other valves that we see. A bit more metering down there and some more relays. Let's have a quick progress and you'll see what I mean. There's a close-up of the uh, of the output uh, stage. You'll see that there's an earth here, then this flexible, it's the outer of RG174 coax with the inner ripped away. So we take the inner out and just left the, the hairy outer that just loosely goes, it's soldered there, then it's quite loose, soldered there, quite loose to earth. And the same for all of them. That's because these valve pins need to move. These are quite rigid, the three there, because these, these components hold them still. But the rest of the pins are all flexible. The Chinese seem to make it that the pins move quite wildly in the bases. So you don't want to solder anything rigidly, because if you actually solder it like that, you could then break the glass, the base of the glass valve, uh, which would not be a good idea because it lets the, the air in, of course. So you want it nice and flexible. So there's no there's no firm connections here. They're all on flexible bits of wire. Uh, and that seems to work well. The uh, I did used to run a single wire all the way along, but that's not good news. And I learned that the hard way to um, to make it flexible. And there's the three connections in from the grids. And there's that RF choke again and the bias resistor that we spoke about and the meter shunt there. So that's the, um, the under chassis view of the PA department. The the valve is constructed so that, uh, which one that's one, so I can't remember the pin number, that must be, doesn't matter, but I think these are pin six. So seven and five are earthy, and it's a screen inside the valve to make sure that the anode connection is kept as screened as far away as it can be from the grid connection, which is here. You do not want those two connections close together or it will cause instability because you haven't got a top cap. You've got to, you've got a base connection, so you've got to make sure that it's kept away. And that's how the Russians did it with the screening. And that's, uh, that's the way to do it. Here's the uh, the PA coil, uh, British, uh, with, with any turns that you find at a rally stripped off and uh, new turns of, of 18 or 16 SWG wire put on. I normally uh, do it up the garden <laughs> by um, put, clamping some wire in a vise, good long length of it, and um, then open the window, have the section of wire all the way up the garden, and start on the first connection there. I solder a lug on there and bolt it on, and then slowly walk towards the, uh, the vise under tension, pull in the wire as I go, uh, as I rotate the coil, and then it all goes on very neatly. And when you get here, you have to quickly just grab it with your fingers between there and the opposite side and slip the tag on and then just nip it with the side cutters to hold it, hold it in place. And then you can cut the excess wire and uh, that will be fine if the nip holds. You can then go inside and solder that up. These are 6BA solder tags from Mr. Burkitt, quite long ones. And you just fold the end over slightly, tin the wire, tin the tag, put the two together and make the tappings for the coil so that they can alter by one turn at a time to what they want to do. <clears throat> you can see the chassis work here. Four mil nuts and bolts. Uh, Jeff, who's the G8 DHI, in uh, solid hull, king of the metalwork bending in Birmingham, makes the chassis for me. And they're standard 19 inch rack mounts, so they can be inserted in, uh, in, in racks if, if desired. Best to have lots of ventilation through them. These are normally ex government type uh, components, always on the lookout for wide space capacitors. And uh, there's the top of the American uh, inductor and the Burkitt. Uh, and the Burkitt capacitor there, 1000 puff, 10 kV. Here's a, the relays and the reasons why. There's the, um, the mains relay, the delay. 
So after 40 seconds, that will shut and allow you to get the mains onto that second switch, and then you can switch the transmitter on. Or if you want, you can leave all the switches on. Full power can be left on here, that can be left on, and the aux can be left on. And from a wall mounted um, auto switch, it will switch on and then it will progress through automatically and power to air without anybody being there. So you've got auto control that way. Very necessary for broadcasting. The next bit is an interesting one. You've got um, a relay here. Uh, this is the low power, high power one, but it also means you've got more control over the transmitter when it comes on the air. When we look at the circuit diagram, I'll show you why and how it works. And the last one is the most important, is, is probably the most important relay. This is the input audio coming in, the 300 odd watts uh, is coming in through this pair of, uh, through this wire and is switched by the relay and then out it goes to the modulation transformer. The reason you've got that relay switch is that there's a pilot relay in the grid of the, uh, in the grid of that tube that, and the grid of these tubes, when grid currents flow in, a relay closes and it will allow that relay to close. If the drive fails or the synthesizer stops working for any reason, you do not want HV on here with modulation going in at 300 odd watts or 160 watts or whatever it is into that modulation transformer. If it's got nowhere to go, there's no drive, there's no power coming out. So those valves are going to soak up a great deal. And the mod transformers are going to not like, not enjoy the high voltage peaks inside it. So you've got to be able to, if the grid drive fails, you've got to be able to turn off the audio. So that's what that does. And that's why there's a drive fail indication or a drive indication on the front to say that you have got grid drive and you can proceed with modulation. And that's what that third relay does. Next picture, right. So I'm just uh, getting the, uh, yeah, here we are, okay. So 250 watt HF transmitter, HV power supply and control circuit. There's a standard mains coming in, Euro mains, 22240. How much voltage would you like, sir? In um, fuse holder, and there's the rectifier, 12 by BY 255s. And it hits this bank of Cs, absolutely bog standard, nothing unusual there. But notice where the smoothing choke is. You'd sometimes expect to find it here in the, positive line. Well, it's not. It's in the negative line and one side's earth. The reason being is if you've got this little choke here that's X pi telecoms and has been working since 1960 in their RTs, you probably don't want to subject it to 600 volts. But if you put it in the negative rail and just lift up the negative from these rectifiers, you can make it that under normal conditions of full power, you could you could earth these capacitors here. Sorry, you could bring this the negative of these capacitors here down and put it on that point. There's your other smoothing capacitors straight across the HV, and they're earth there. They're always across the full H the, across the HV rail. That's set R the two twenty UF set, but the four seventies are switchable, and if you have this relay control here, you can decide by a relay, do you want to put this bank of capacitors, do you want to put it to the earthy side, which means that this is now choke input, because all you've got in the line is the bottom of the rectifier, negative, hits a choke, and then out. That's choke input smoothing. Or do you want capacitor input smoothing? Click, and then this bank has moved from this side to that side, and you get the full HT then that you get with capacitive input. The differences are eight, about 800 volts in capacity input and choke input about 650. <coughs> so quite a useful tool that. When you want to run it automatically, if you put yourself a little timer here and keep that switch down, when you power up the HT, it always powers up uh, low. So you get the HD comes on 650 volts. And I set this little timer 
to about three quarters of a second. There it is, there's the timer there. Switch the HT on, three quarters of a second later, it switches and then moves that relay from low power to full power. So under, under automatic conditions with the lads in Germany who don't attend the transmitter site, it always comes on at low power for three quarters of a second and then up to full. And broadcast transmitters normally do exactly the same thing. There's a couple of LEDs to show you what the condition is and they work by relay as well. But that's, um, that's the high power, low power sw switching. I've actually just had a lad here today who's brought me a transmitter from Leicester. <clears throat> he wants me to wave change it. It's medium wave. It was on 1260 kilohertz. He wants it to move into 1575, but he doesn't want it to run at 250 watts or 200 watts. He wants it to run at 100 watts or 120. So I'll make it that he can always run it in the low condition. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll affect that for him. So it'll only ever run in the low condition. So that's um, a very useful uh, tool, that being able to switch uh, the capacitors on a, on a power supply to meet choke input or capacitor input. Here's the, um, the driver stage. Um, the, the, the MR2 is the synthesizer from GW4GTE. And the waffle board, Eric now in Wenvo makes the waffle, a copy of the waffle board, but he doesn't market it because it's a bit too much of a copy if you get my meaning. But if you want one, he, he, he will supply this pit pirate board. <laughs> Although it does use a different chip because uh, he found it a, a cheaper one that was better. Uh, anyway, that's the waffle board. So you get about 12 volts uh, peak to peak out here, which you drive into the tube. The tube runs, this valve runs in class C, it's just got a bit of bias on it just to protect it in case it's, it, there's no driving coming. So you just got a bit of protective bias there. 47K input, nice high impedance. Tuned circuit on the uh, anode and out goes your drive to those, uh, to those grids. There's the... Uh, 20Ks to make a, a 20K resistor at the top there. Um, on, this, on the circuit diagram here, I actually uh, used the switch mode power supply to get 12, to get 19 volts out and then dropped it by an, a, a 7812 regulator to get 12 volts for the synthesizer board and the module. It's another way of doing it. The control volts for the transmitter always come from the heater supply with a rectifier. But if I want a bit more, if I want a bit more current then, I have to use a switch mode power supply like we've got there. This is the uh, circuit diagram of uh, the output stage. Uh, starting at the top then, you've got the HT coming in at about 850, 800. There's the mod transformer, the secondary. P1 goes to uh, the disco amp via the protective relays, etc. cetera. Uh, a bit more about that on, on at the bottom of the page, I'll show you in a second. Here's the, um, the two 10Ks, the big green ones in series to give 20K at 50 watts onto the screen of the final. You've got the dropper, you've got the parasitic stoppers there and the expensive American choke, the Verkit capacitor, the homemade coil, PA tune and load, just a 50 picofarads across that to make sure that you can't dial up the second harmonic by mistake. <coughs> There's a couple of Cs here, a very low value one, 2200 peak farads and a, a coaxial connector from that point just to give you a stiff for the uh, scope probe so you can look at the modulation depth meter shunt in the cathode to earth bypass with the uh, old millard capacitors and the cathode current meter there the uh, the grids then drive comes in 33 ohms or 27 there's your 2.6 million reach choke that keeps the rf from disappearing down this chain here but because you can get at that voltage, you can whiz that voltage off and stick it That's into the perfect. grid of this valve. This valve is the pair of PL84s just sit like that with a big fat negative voltage on them, which means they're not going to conduct. And they sit at the end of here on the screen grid point. And under normal conditions of normal power, they do not conduct. No, no, no anode current flows and that screen voltage stays at the correct value. If the drive fails, it does two things. Uh, it makes that valve conduct, which then drops the screen voltage to a low level, stops those valves for, for conducting very hard and burning themselves out. 
but it also, there's no grid current, if that relay drops out, the 48 volt one, and that's the one that drives that little interlock to let that audio through from the big boys disco amp. Here's the amplifier input. And there's the there's the, the big relay you saw. And there's the winding of the mod transformer. When you're using solid state amps, they're designed to work into loudspeakers. Uh, loudspeakers do not look like, to amplifiers, do not look like uh, big fat mod transformers. They look like, uh, these amplifiers are designed for big loudspeakers, not the big fat modulation transformers full of inductance. So you have to put a compensating network in a couple of C's and a resistor just to uh, tone it down. I have found, <coughs> excuse me, that some amps are even can't quite be stabilized even with that. So I just give the operators a chance to put a couple of series R's in here, half an ohm and one ohm, 50 watt rated, which I supply them shorted out. And if they want to just cut the link, they can just pop a bit of extra resistance in there just to give the amplifier something to load into. So that's the, the trick of the trade on that one. So that's the output circuit and the, and the protection. Oh, I can't go backwards now, rats. <laughs> oh, I can. I don't want to exit. I want to go back. Hang on. Oh, I see. It's the same circuit. Don't panic. We've had that slide. So here's the last slide. OK, we spoke about the authorities in Europe wanting to make some money from their licensing and a lot of enthusiasts in Europe wanting to go on the air. Uh, one of the first ones that went on the air is Europa 24 here on 6150, and that's using one of my transmitters, daily, 8 o'clock to 16 hours. Then the two German lads, the other German lads started with shortwave gold, daily, 18 to 22, and Saturdays at extended times. And also on the 4 megahertz band, they got 3975, which was an old BBC frequency. Uh, then slowly but surely, other groups came on. Uh, Cal Krakow was an ex-military establishment. They came on 3985. And then another group came on at Weinemur in Germany. And now, channel 292, which had been on six, the 6 megahertz area for a while, they've allocated them 3955, which is BBC when it's, BBC, it's, a, it's, a, it's a UK channel allocated to Wufferto. <clears throat> and used for um, external service broadcasting, but not by the BBC. They've got uh, Radio Taiwan International on it now for a couple of hours a day. So Channel 292 use it the rest of the time. Um, and then the guy who makes this sheet every month is uh, from Denmark. Hans, no, Hans Stig, Stig, somebody, Stig Hartvig Nielsen. And he's been after doing stuff on shortwave for years and he finally got a license. And he's World Music Radio 5930 Bramming 24 seven. That's another of my transmitters he's using there. But besides that, he's got stuff on medium wave. Now, have we lost Dave or is it me? I can't hear him either. We, we've lost Dave. Uh, let's hope he um, reappears in the mo moment because I know he was getting towards the end. Oh, so, Mr. Chairman, talk amongst yourselves. Hopefully, Dave will reappear in a moment. Okay. Um, yeah. I like the construction. All I can say is, thank God, he's not entering our construction championship. 
Otherwise, we might as well give him the shield permanently for the next few years, as they say. <clears throat> I don't know where he's gone. No, Probably his internet must anywhere. have dropped out, so um, maybe he'll try and get back yeah. to us. Well, hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, was, it was very interesting, that. Um, yeah. I, I know it's not strictly amateur radio, but um, anyone who's seen my AM transmitter will recognise quite a few of the design quirks. Yeah. In my transmitter. Not quite. Oh, here he comes. Let's see if we can let him back in. It's just a... He's connecting his audio. He's back. Hello, I'm back in. Five nine. I got <laughs> bombed out there. Sorry, it's, it's, I talk too much. Right, <laughs> that was the end. I hope you saw it all. Yeah. Yeah. You can Good see indeed. the patient stig at the end. Uh, I'll just go full screen. Then, if anybody wants to ask me any questions, I'm sure I've forgotten something. But you might, if you've thought of anything, please ask it. Yes, I'm sure John or someone might have something. Uh, I did notice the old 555 timer in there, Dave. Those, those chips have been going for years, haven't they? Yeah, do you know why it's called 555? No, go on. It took me ages to find out, because if you look at the internal circuitry from the sort of uh, input voltage rail that you use to power it to Earth, yeah. there, are five, there are three 5K ohm resistors in series, so it was called the 555. Well, there you are. Not no, many people know that. No, I can remember we built little timer circuits and things with those when I was at school. Yeah, well, yeah. They're, they're so reliable, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's right. But, um, no, we were just admiring the handiwork. It's, um, it, it's uh, your construction's always beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, yeah, I've done right. it a bit, you know. I've done well, a like, few. Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit like seeing my father, who retired a couple of three years, a similar time to Dave, and he was a tool maker, and some of the things he builds with his lathe, not to think electric, electrical, but you know, he, he builds things. I like a work of art and yeah. functional. Yes. <laughs> it's good to see mechanical engineering done properly. Like it's good yeah. to see anything done properly, really, you know. But I mean, I've, I've been lucky by looking in, I've been lucky by seeing how Marconi's did it. it and there's nothing like seeing another example, really, to, to know how to do it, you know. Well, we were lucky enough to have a Mark, an old Marconi station up in Wayne Vow, not far from us. Yeah. Unfortunately, he didn't leave anything behind, did he? But, uh, nothing there. You know, <laughs> nothing there at all, except the building, of course, which is, well, well, yes, I could say, well, you could say the building is well constructed. Okay, we've got a bit of woodworm in one floor, one part there, but the rest <laughs> of it's perfectly intact, you know? Yeah. And I, yeah. I'm not sure whether it's the only one in it in the country that's intact, is it? Well, Krigian's yeah. been sort of partially preserved, but I don't think there's any yeah. kit in it. I'm seeing the guy tomorrow from Krigian who's running it is a is a GW. Yeah. Or an MW. Can't think of his name. Robert. Yeah. Anyway, Robert. He's coming down tomorrow. Um but I think he's trying to get something going there. But I think I, I've got a horrible feeling it was left too long. When they cleared out before we had a go at it, you know what I'm I'm saying? It's probably a bit was a bit too derelict, you know. Yeah. Well, this one's been a climbing centre and God knows what, and it's even been a strip club up there. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about that. No, you wouldn't have any experience with that. <laughs> no, no, no. It's uh, there's been a strip club there, and they called it was actually called the Marconi Club. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, there's a few stories about that, but not now, uh, fit to go on here, of course. Yeah, Mark, uh, two, uh, Mark, two whiskey, one MRK had to go. He had family duties to attend to, but wanted to pass on his thanks to Dave. No problem. He, did, he, he didn't have a particular question. He, I did say we've recorded this because there's three or four that wanted to be here that can't. So we'll put it on YouTube and send them a private link so that if you don't oh, mind, right, Dave. Yeah. Well, I don't. I didn't want to bore you too much, but. It's just it's um, it's just good to try and pass the skills on and still that you can still you know you can still do this if you want to you know there's a stuff still out there you might have to scour a few rallies but uh, if you fancy getting the chassis cutters out and having the cut hands you can uh, yeah. you can enjoy yourselves 
Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> we've, we've got our construction competition next month. And as Danny said when you were absent, thank goodness you're not in our club. <laughs> well, I, I did we just gave you the shield and just write it on it, you know. I That's did, about I did, 2030 or something. I put in for one at uh, put in for one at Haas, and actually I was successful because I built a I built a 50 watt GU. Those output tubes are GU 50s or RY 50s in Russian, and uh, I built a 50 watt a, a 50 watt rig using just one tube uh, for five megahertz on AM. But I can't use it anymore because uh, the propagation is so blessed awful. It's just, it's just not working at all on five megs at the moment. It's such a shame. And mm. I don't know whether you lads are finding mm. that seven megs is just as bad as well. There's no, there's no, there's nothing at all. It's just not going, you know. Yeah, mm. we're still waiting. <coughs> still waiting. Um, waiting. 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 Yeah. Uh, just well, just I, for those, yeah. those of you who are on, um, that um, the 4th of October, we've got a chap called Nick Wood, who's a fairly recent amateur, but he's he's been a, a tinkerer with electronics for years, M0NTV, who's talking some construction as well of uh, some HF rigs he's built. And he tends to go by building them in little modules, you know, piecemeal modules. And they're not beautifully tidy like Dave's. When you see the photos of his equipment, it looks that he builds them into metal bread bins and things like that, and uh, it looks like a rat's nest. It wouldn't. It wouldn't go. In, oh, Dave. Oh, there it is. Still there. It doesn't look beautiful like Dave. But honestly, you know, for what he wants, it's twenty watts output that peak on SSB on eighty and forty, it, they they work. Mm. But um, anyway, uh, Brian KZ, brilliant talk. Thanks to Dave. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I much. thought I thought it was quite brilliant as well. It reminds me. The first receiver I ever built, actually. Um, well, I did build an HHC one. I suppose people have heard of them. Uh, Here all, all continent one. Here all continents, yeah. That's it, yeah. But I actually built one on a um, <clears throat> an oven tin and cut the valve holes and everything in it, and it worked quite successfully. And I thought, brilliant, you know, okay, so it's a bit dirty and everything like this. But it worked brilliantly until my mother decided to open the oven oh. and found that this tin was missing. <laughs> uh, I'm not exactly going to tell you what she said, but uh, I ended up having no pocket money for a few weeks till we got this new tin. <laughs> and I don't know what she wants, but she got dozens of other tins, you know, of all sorts of descriptions and everything. But this specific tin, you see, was to do a chicken in. Yeah, well, well. Yeah, we didn't have chickens very often. To be honest with you, when I was a kid, we didn't have chickens very often. You get a piece of beef or a beef of pork off the butcher, but never a chicken. You used to have to go and find one, you know, and uh, <clears throat> do whatever you had to do. Like that. But, uh, <laughs> she wasn't very happy, but, <clears throat> you know. Dave, you got any uh, questions for um, Dave? Dave? Dave, are you still involved in Wufferton at all? Uh, yes and no. Um, I was there in March. Uh, Matt, Matt obviously is working there now, as is Dave Passy, another local amateur. And another lad came from uh, Seychelles because the BBC sh shut the Seychelles relay. So he mm. went to work at Ascension for a bit and then uh, got fed up with that before he'd come to the UK. So his name's um, Norris, Richard Norris. Speaks ace French as well as because he's yeah, mm -hmm. like on Seychelles. Speaks ace French as well as English. So he's yeah. there. So there's quite a few youngsters there. But what we decided to do was move the repeater. We've had a Glyn G4AIJ, who was a senior transmitter engineer like me uh, at the same time. We, uh, we, we used a redundant antenna at Wolferton that was sitting on the mast yeah, and swapped it. It, it was with a feeder was there. And there's a there was an antenna at 90 meters above the ground uh, for 141 megahertz. So we couldn't resist the temptation to have a repeater. Mm. We were going to use 430 megahertz, but channels were hard to come by. So we managed to find a two meter channel and took a chance because we thought the HF Spurious might get in on two meters, but in the end it didn't. But anyway, we got a channel and we swapped the antenna. So we had the riggers swap the antenna. For us to a two meter one collinear 
a professional one. You, there's no point putting up Mickey Mouse stuff, um, uh, bits of uh, mm. scraper or anything, because you have to negotiate mm. with the riggers to go and climb uh, 100 metres. And they and you say to them, would you, uh, I know you put that antenna up a few weeks ago, would you mind awfully climbing it again and putting a, another one up? And they say, yes, of course, David, that's no problem at all. Not. Uh, mm. So you fit one to be done with. And that was it. So we fitted a, a, a Procom, a Procom one, which is Danish, uh, yeah. and that was fine. And we used the redundant coax, and eventually got a repeater on the air, GB3 Victor Mike. It'd been running there for a long time, but uh, Glyn and I were approached a couple of years ago by the local radio person uh, round here, Muff Murphy, to say could we build a relay station for him on FM uh, from Clee Hill because he'd found a site. It took him a long time, but we, he did find a site. No. And we went and looked at it and worked out how to do it. And so we decided on in March, we, we got the FM running, he's got his service running. So we thought we'd move the repeater from Wolferton. So Matt uh, was heavily involved in that. So I went to Wolf and did that. We got it out of the building and carted it up to Clear Hill. Then we had another guy who was still in Arkiva, brought his test gear, who built the combiner, the duplexer. And he checked it all out for us after the move and it survived the move okay so we recommissioned mm -hmm. vm on clee hill and that's running now uh with a, a greater footprint than it had before let's say because the antennas at 434 meters asl not 90 meters asl sorry 90 plus 76 uh 176 meters asl it was mm -hmm. before uh but it's now at 434 meters asl mm -hmm. so that's doing okay I tell you why, Dave. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I, I arranged uh, twelve months ago a, a, a twelve a, a seven day holiday uh, in a little cottage in Orleton, which is just on the road oh, yeah. from. And I was in correspondence with Glyn, I think it was, who's since passed away, hasn't he? He has. I was, was going to say he never keeper. got to see the completed change or the VHF. Come on, it was such a and, shame. I'd arranged in a very impromptu and official uh, a weekend, I think it was, visit to the um, the Wolverton station. And of course, it never happened, did it? Because of uh, COVID, I couldn't come down and things were closing up and what have you. So it's, yeah, it's very, very disappointed. Well, hopefully, if we get a chance, we can we can restart those. But of course, mm -hmm. it depends on on the uh, the COVID situation. You know, the, mm -hmm. the lads are up for it, and the the company's got no problem yeah. with it. It's not Babcock anymore, so yeah. it's a lot easier than it used to be, um, because Babcock was a military company, mm -hmm. so that's more tricky. But now it's Encompass Digital Media, yeah. and um, they they do shortwave but their main business is moving program around the planet and in fact I, I did pop in the other day to see Matt and he was working in a room and next door is a shed load of stuff all with Amazon Prime video going through so that's uh, it's amazing what goes through that place these days mm -hmm. which was amazing what went through Wolf but that's uh, what's happening now um mm -hmm. So yes, it was uh, when we when we moved the repeater VM. It was a shame that Glyn never lived to to see the move, even though he'd been heavily involved in the planning. But since then, we've moved Victor November there uh, on seventy SEMS. But in the interim, we did have GB seven VO on the new site for a little while. Uh, uh, that moved from Jeff's Hill House place, where Haas meets in the summer, uh, which is just south of Lemster. That moved to. Um, Hill. That moved to Clee Hill. But just today, I've moved GB7VO down to Hope Baggett, uh, 